There are four biblical indices that measure a believer's growth. How do I know I am growing? How do I know I am making progress? Number one, are you ready? The first biblical index that measures your growth spiritually is your degree of conformity to the image and the character of the Christ in experience. Write it down, please. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. This is the first biblical index to measure growth. No matter how long you have been in church, no matter what kind of spiritual activity you have been involved with, if we look at your life and we do not find an experiential manifestation of the image and the character of the Christ, you are not growing. It's as simple and as honest as that. Colossians chapter 3, when you read from verse 1 to 15, for sake of time, we may not have all the time to exhaust it, but the Bible says, if ye be risen with Christ, if it is true, if it's a fact that you have been risen with Christ, then it says your passions, your appetite, you should seek the things that are above. Is that true? Where Christ seated at the right hand of God. Prove to me that you are risen with Christ. Not just by your confession, but by your passion. I should see where your passion is. The next verse, when we read to verse 15, let's touch one or two of the verses if we can. Verse 2. The whole text is to verse 15, Colossians chapter 3. It says, set your affection on things above and not on things in the earth. He's not saying to ignore the things in the earth, but he's saying in order of priority, I should be able to see a level of passion for the things of God. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Then the next verse, he now begins to tell you to put off certain things. Is that true? Put off and then put on. That you, you remove it like an old garment. Now, you don't hear a lot of this being discussed in church. It's the reason why we raise the kinds of people we are raising. Can I be honest with you? In this kingdom, character is a principal measure of spiritual growth. More than anointing. More than miracles. Character. Character. I can know. That the Lord is working in you because what I saw in you yesterday as a limitation should not be found again tomorrow. If I, I agree that you come to him as you are, but you don't stay as you are. Please hear me. You come as you are, but you cannot remain as you are. where we allow anybody to come as they are provided they are willing to be made when you come and follow me I will not leave you that way I will make you now I, I South Africa you cook you cook well and you cook a lot and I'm, I know that some of you are chefs you know how it is to make food if you want to prepare food sometimes you have to strip some of the ingredients from their original state they have to bend. That is the price it would take for them to participate in that meal. They come as they are, but if they must be in that pot, you have to cut some of them. You have to shred some of them. You have to blend some of them. If you must find your way from the farm to that pot, you must be willing to pass through that making. Most believers want to be featured in God's program. God's end time program but they want to be featured the way they are with the backlog of pride and jealousy and flesh and lust no sir you come as you are but then you allow the rabbi to now begin to walk on you can I tell you the truth when God is pruning you is proof that you are important in his program when a pastor is pruning you is proof that he has discerned that there is great grace on your life
How do I know I am growing spiritually? The degree of conformity. Regardless region, regardless tribe, when you come to Christ, I should know you are a Christian, not by your praying in tongues. There should be such a level of dexterity in your character. It is not when you begin to sing Christian songs that I should know you are a Christian. If you have to tell me your name and pray in tongues, you are not a Christian. So the backlog of anger, jealousy, and all these things that came with our backgrounds. Come as you are, but you cannot remain as you are. Second Peter chapter 1. Is God helping us this morning? Amen. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5 to 7. Remember the theme of the conference, the next move of God. We are dealing with all of the factors that are responsible for making this happen. First Peter, please, very quickly. Second Peter, I meant to say Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. Let's read together. I like it when we read together. Ready? We're reading to verse 7. And beside this, it says, uh-huh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Next verse. And to knowledge temperance or self-control and to temperance patience and to patience, godliness. Verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Don't tell me you have faith. What have you added to it since you got born again? The Bible tells us add. Add. Remember our meal again. You are preparing this. The chef will give you a manual. After five minutes, add this to this. Add this portion to this. Add this portion to this. You do not add equal portions of everything. There are some things you just need a pinch of like salt. But there are some things you need a lot of. We have majored on the minors and minored on the majors. There are some things that must be lavishly at work in your life. Imagine with me that just because salt is needed in your meal, you put a handful of salt... Imagine that you want to cook rice and rice becomes the smallest ingredient you add. You pick rice and then salt. What did you make? <laughs> salt is needed, but not as much as rice. Can I be honest with you? There are many things we need in our life as believers, but we need to examine the emphasis. This is, this is, this is it. Men of God, remember we are spiritual chefs. According to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, every time we meet with God's people, we feed them. The meal is wisdom and knowledge. Are we together? And as we prepare those meals, we have to be careful. There are things we have emphasized in the body of Christ now above Jesus, now above character. You see, that's the reason why the meal that we're producing, the things are not bad in themselves. For instance, prosperity. For instance, greatness. For instance, these things are not wrong, but there is a proportion. We Jesus must be the center. If I taste that meal, even if it's a pinch of it, I should taste Jesus. More than prosperity, more than healing, more than miracles. By the time the meal is made of miracles, you, are, you have damaged the whole. I will give you shepherds or pastors after my heart as spiritual chefs. And they will feed you with knowledge and they will feed you with understanding you can know a healthy church imagine you know in many parts of africa we we have seen people who have been impoverished malnourished and you can see their state the children don't have to tell you i am sick and you can see very healthy well-fed children they don't have to tell you i am healthy you can look at a christian and know that something is wrong 
we need to go to that pot and check what you've been eating. Are we blessed? Your degree of conformity to the, to the image and the character of the Christ. Galatians chapter 5. Popular scripture. Many of you have forgotten it. You've not read it in a long time. Let's go to the Bible. Galatians 5, 22. Galatians 5, 22. Are we still together? But the fruit of the Spirit. Hmm. Can I tell you this? There is a difference between gifts and fruit. Fruit is proof that the tree is matured. It, a, a, you can give a gift to anything. An animal can, demo, can manifest the gift of the spirit, but not the fruit of the spirit. A fruit means that the tree has grown. There is no tree that has fruits as a baby tree. It has to be a full grown tree. So when the Bible says the fruit of the spirit, you have to understand this. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. Can I tell you these are the conditions that the whole world is looking for? Everywhere across all the whole world, they are looking for the fruit of the spirit. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. 23, meekness, temperance. He says, against such, there is no law. Against such, there is no law. There are many, many believers who do not have the fruit of the Spirit at work in them. And we continue to justify this anger is a family thing. What then is the excellency of your meeting Jesus? We are jealous, that's how we are. Just leave me. When I'm angry, even my mother knows I've been like that. Then change. This is why you came to church. Are we together now? There are many preachers who can kill when they are angry. They are anointed. But you have to be careful. It was lack of this that made Moses. Even though he met God face to face, he could not get... Your degree of conformity. When I found this, I made up my mind as a man of God. I said, I will have to train myself by the Spirit so that my life becomes an expression of the character of the Christ in reality. Can I be honest with you? Character is not an impartation. You work it out. You work it out. You build character by submitting to the word of God as final authority over your life in all matters. That means regardless how I feel, what does the word of God says to be done in this situation? Your feeling and your pain, you enter a, a non-emotional covenant of compliance. If the word of God says to be instant in season and out of season, then that becomes my template. If the word of God says love, that is it. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of the Christ. Are we learning something? This is very, very important. Number two, let's hurry up for time. The second biblical index that measures spiritual growth and maturity is your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. I'll take it again. We're in the school of the spirit, so don't worry about my long sentence. I will repeat it until you write it down. Ready? Your depth of comprehension or understanding of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. First Corinthians 14, 20. How do I know that I am growing? 
How do I know that I'm increasing? How do I know that a church is growing? Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice? Be ye children, but in understanding be men. Can I be honest with you? You can know that you are growing spiritually to the degree to which you begin to understand the ways of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom should not be new. It shouldn't be strange to you. You shouldn't be in church for one year, two years, and you know nothing about the principles of prayer. You know nothing about seed sowing. Imagine someone who has been in church for three, four years. You have to explain to them the principles. So, no, you should know these things by now. There are principles. Listen to me. This kingdom, the Bible says in Psalm 82 from verse 5 to 7, Psalm 82 from verse 5 to 7, let me quote it fast because of time. It says, they know not neither will they understand. So this is a problem of ignorance. It says they walk on in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Next verse, verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods and all of you, how many? Are children of the most high. The tragedy is in the next verse. It says, but you shall die like mere men and fall like one of the princes. Knowledge and understanding is what gives you stature and stability. It's important that you are not just a Christian because of your participating in spiritual activities. You must be sure you are growing. What have you learned this year that you did not know last year? What have you learned this month that you did not know last month? Have you added to your knowledge bank spiritually? applicable spiritual knowledge not just random knowledge that is useless as far as your destiny is concerned knowledge Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 Paul was praying over the church in Colossae and he prayed that they be built across three dimensions of knowledge Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 he says, praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they be filled with, number one, the knowledge of his will. Number two, they be filled with all wisdom. And number three, they be filled with all, with spiritual understanding. Are we together? Please let me have two gentlemen, very quickly, just two of you. Thank you, sir. Please stand here, please stand here. You would notice that I like to teach giving illustrations because people seem to understand it more. Now watch this. This man is a child of God. This man is a child of God. I always will give this example. Now say they got born again the same day. Are we together? And this one happens to be under a pastor who understands doctrine and is now being mentored methodically and raised in a way that you can see the man growing. And this one sadly, let's assume that he just found himself somewhere around a spiritual atmosphere whose growth is scattered and not methodical. Now, after two years, they come together and you ask him, what do you know about prayer? He prays and you tell him, lead us in a prayer session. And you see him praying and miss because he does not, he's not been taught. Do you know that you are taught to pray? You don't just pray, you are taught to pray. That's the only way to not pray amiss. The disciples said, teach us to pray. They did not have a problem with prayerlessness. It was effective prayer. The issue was not prayerlessness. It was inefficiency in prayer. And Jesus taught them to pray. This man is in a situation right now. He does not understand the dominion systems in the kingdom. He does not know that there is a mystery that can exempt men from evil. He does not know how to defend himself over the wiles of darkness. His, his life, even though he's born again, but you see his experience as though he does not know Jesus. Here comes this gentleman. Now he's been taught spiritual warfare. He's been taught the economic system of the kingdom. He's been taught knowledge. He's been taught character. Who do you think will excel? In their Christian work. Are we together? Yes. 
You can be this man or this man. The choice is yours. Your depth of comprehension. In Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. The Bible records that Jesus wept twice in the Bible. First was at the grave of Lazarus. Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. The first time Jesus would weep was at the grave of Lazarus. And they said, oh, how he loved him. The second time Jesus was about to weep was over Jerusalem. He said he came to it and he beheld the city and wept over it. Why did he weep? Verse 2, please read with me. Ready? One to read. Saying, if thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Jesus wept because of the ignorance of the people. You know you are growing to the degree to which you comprehend the truths of the kingdom. Now, I, I, if I call believers at random, now I'm not just speaking to House of Treasures, I'm speaking to Africa, I'm speaking to the globe. Are we together? Imagine with me, like I said yesterday, call a believer at random. Let's have a few believers, for instance, to stand here and let's now begin to interview them along the lines of the principles of the kingdom. And you will see, respectfully speaking, the poor job that we men of God have done. When the average believer is in trouble, they do not understand the weapons of victory. They bring the blood of Jesus, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the word of God, scripture, touching and agreeing, seed. They mix everything and hope that one will work. And truly one will work. The challenge is you can never gain mastery because you do not know which worked. Are we together? So the average believer is superstitious in his spiritual approach. I know there is blood in that equation. I know there is name. I know there is scripture. I know there is a seed. I know there is a prophetic covering. I just know that these things are there. Please produce miracles for me. The Bible says, he that strives for mastery is not crowned except he strives lawfully. We must rise to a higher level of mastery where you know which spiritual operation is responsible for what outcome. With precision. Watch a consultant as he talks with a patient. Oh, so how are you? And the patient is ranting. I have headache. I have this, in fact, body weakness. And the man is laughing. He's beyond the words, the frail words of the patient. He's looking for specific things because he has been trained to identify patterns that lead to outcomes. And with digital precision, sometimes he may not even need the aid of any machine. He will say, you have malaria. You have typhoid. And he laughs and says, don't worry. In three days, you'll be fine. And the man, he said, you don't even know what is happening. I says, it's true. I may not understand, but you don't worry. Trust my prescription. I was trained. I didn't just become a consultant by luck. <laughs> take this, take that, take this, take fruits. You do this, go and rest. And even when you call him the next day and say, this thing has not changed. Say, just keep doing what I asked you to do. <laughs> After four days, you are running, playing football, and he looks at you and says, it worked. And every time you have malaria, he will give you the same thing. Are you learning something this morning? Let me tell you this. If you're a man of God here, let this be a word of deliverance. The pressure to make sure you teach something new every Sunday, be delivered from it. In this kingdom, our focus is not newness, but freshness. Because the body of truth allocated for your growth is finite. You can exhaust it and start again. And exhaust it and start again. And exhaust it and start again. This was the strategy that great men like Papa Hagin, they would teach across subjects for the rest of their life. So if you went to their congregations, you would see them solid. Teaching a truth once does not mean members have received it. You must repeat it again with freshness, greater revelation, greater fire. Don't teach giving once. Don't teach righteousness once. Don't teach salvation once. Teach it again and again. That is the curriculum. There is no other thing again. 
Please sit down. Our generation has such an obsession for newness. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is the reason why when you check your notes as a man of God, oh dear, I've taught on faith. I've taught on character. I've taught on leadership. What is left? Uh, and then we go online and you just browse. Enter and you see anything new without verification, we ship it to our altars and give people something to consume who we'll later find out it is poison. Can I tell you this? Please hear me, men of God and women of God. The way you preach in a conference is not the way you should preach to your people. When you are preaching in a conference, you are constrained by time and you are teaching across two or three days. The highest conference will be maybe just like a week or so and with several speakers. But when you are mentoring your people, be methodical, be intentional, stay there. They are there with you for life. Teach them, groom them, build them. Let your message be in series. Take it step by step. Don't wrap up the whole message of faith in two hours. They will need more than that to be strong. Hmm. Hallelujah. Are we learning? Please hear me. We must be very intentional about training and building our people. So you learn. Oh, you got it. In the university, remember, I don't know how it works in South Africa here, but let, let's say, for instance, you're studying mathematics. There is something called Math 101. Then you do Math 201. Same subject, a higher perspective of it. So there is Faith 101, the basics, you just get it. And later on, you meet a stumbling block you cannot understand. You go back, the next Faith series will answer that question. Listen, it is when it has to do with knowing God that we can never exhaust him. But when it has to do with the weapons of victory given to the saints, the body of knowledge given is finite. The same way a student can graduate from a university it doesn't mean learning stops. But as far as the body of knowledge allocated is concerned, you have exhausted it. Are we together? That means you are in this place, you should be able to tell me the role of the blood in a believer's life. At what point in my Christian experience should I apply the blood? At what point should I use the name? At what point should I use the word? What should I do with a spirit that seems to be stubborn? Do I know what to do with it? When I'm constrained financially, why is that so? And what should I do? This is knowledge. If I'm in a situation where defeat is imminent, what is the spiritual strategy to engage at that point? If my life has been delayed by reason of whatever, how can I accelerate my journey using these weapons of victory? Because the Bible shows me that speed is a possibility. So what is the key to activating it in my life? If people do not like me, how can I change that spiritual narrative by a mystery called favor? How does it work? Are you learning? How can I rise from nothing to a position of influence? Is influence necessary? If yes, what are the keys that control influence? How can I remain on fire and pray in season and out of season? Because in my experience, I found out that prayer is not, prayer is not as cheap as many people make it look. How can I remain consistent studying the word? How can I be so great and anointed yet humble? What are the keys I need to learn? What are the consequences of pride? How do I last and remain? Do you know the keys that govern all these things I have said? If not, then we have a lot of work to do. Are we together? When you send your children to school, they do not teach them just one subject. 
they have a variety of subjects intended to build them in a certain way. I can tell you, many believers are stunted in their growth. We are aware of many possibilities in the kingdom, but we do not have the keys that activate those possibilities. So if I ask you, does God lift? Yes. Does God bless? Yes. Can I know him more? Yes. Is the prophetic realm real? Yes. Can God restore? Can God favor? Can God turn negative situations around? Can you show me how? You see, ask a businessman who is a multi-millionaire justifiably. He will defend his wealth by giving you an accurate roadmap. He will tell you, bring someone as naive as whatever. Let him just be opened. In one year, I can transform that person. We must have that level of methodical approach in the body of Christ. Otherwise, I tell you, the spiritual products that will, stick, will keep coming from the church, will, it will be a situation of casualties. Everybody say knowledge. knowledge. Please shout it, knowledge. knowledge. Let me give you an assignment if you care. I'd like you to write honestly. Thank God your note is just for you. Just write every dimension of the kingdom that you are truly yet to handle in terms of experiential knowledge. Let that become your personal project. What do I honestly not know? Do I understand this finance thing? Don't lie and say I know. What do you know about finances? I can give. That's not the only key. This auditorium has several doors. If you have only one key, you may be in trouble. Imagine with me a big house. You may have heard me give this instance. Imagine a very large house with 10 to 12 rooms. If you have only the key to the kitchen and you need to use the restroom, you are in trouble. Because the key to the kitchen will not open the restroom. You are in the house, but you are not at peace. If the only key you have is the key to the restroom, you are in the house, but when the restroom will not give you food, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Not a key, the keys of the kingdom. The key that controls your spiritual fire. The key that controls your economic empowerment. The key that controls your excelling in your career. The key that controls your longevity. The key that controls you walking in peace. The key that controls victory over demons and the cohorts of darkness. You hold those keys and you move with them. Every door that stands before you, if it's a demonic door, you search what keys. You open that door and you move. If you stand and it's an economic door, you check. What did my pastor teach me? Believers, please hear me. Our territories are in trouble until we truly have the keys of the kingdom. Not just as men of God, but that the average believer will become so fortified and sound. Am I wasting your time this morning? Please give us Luke chapter 1. Let me show you something very powerful. Luke chapter 1, we are reading the first four verses and I'll plead that you read with me. This is my prayer for house of treasures and this is my prayer for South Africa, Africa and the globe. Are you ready? First four verses. One to read. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among God. Stop there. Just stop there first. There are things that should be most surely believed in every congregation that reflect the grace. If you are oral robots, the healing ministry should be one of the areas that are most surely believed among your congregation. If you are Benny Hinn, you should, your members should not be doubting the reality of the existence of Jesus. They may doubt other things, but not that one. That is the foundational pillar of that ministry. There are things that should be most surely believed. I can doubt others. I'm yet to get it, but this one, no, I've, I've held it. I have my foot in solid there. Verse 2. 
even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things. Stop. <laughs> ah, I love the Bible. So a man can have perfect understanding. Look at it now. He is defending his understanding. He's saying, look, it's not pride. I've had perfect understanding on these things. Haven't had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. To write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. Why am I writing? Read verse 4 if you are a Christian. One to read. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I want to bring you to a point of persuasion, he says, so that you no longer doubt those things. So that they don't just become your pastor's revelation, they now become your revelation. The woman at the well ran and called the people and said, come see a man who has told me all that I have done. They didn't come because they loved Jesus. They didn't come because they cared about him. They came because of the impact of her testimony. But when they came, the Bible says they sat with Jesus and heard themselves. And later on, they would turn to the woman and say, now we believe, not only because of what you have said, we have seen this for ourselves. <laughs> Spiritual growth and maturity is when you get to a point in the spirit where your persuasions are now your own. You have become one with them. Whether you are asked to give or not, it's a revelation you already have. There's no waiting for any special program. Whether you are asked to pray or not, anything that is told you is a mere encouragement, but intrinsically, it has become a revelation to you. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Gentlemen, thank you. May God bless you. Thank you, sir. Are we learning this morning? So, your depth of comprehension of the mysteries of the kingdom. In 2 Peter, our last scripture for this very point, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. Popular scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. It says, grace and peace be multiplied. How? Through knowledge. Grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge, not through desire, through knowledge, through knowledge. Every dimension of grace you seek, there is a knowledge component. If you do not have the requisite level of knowledge, you cannot walk in that level of grace. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge. Number three, let's hurry up. We are listing four indices to measure spiritual growth. Number one, we said is the degree of your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. Number two, your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom, spiritual illumination, high level spiritual illumination, your encounter with light. Number three, the outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life, the outworkings. The third way we know you are growing spiritually is through the outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life. My goodness. The outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life. Please look up. This kingdom is a kingdom of power. This is a kingdom of results. And there should come a point in your life where as you press towards the things of God, the ability of the Spirit should begin to manifest through you. It has nothing to do with being in the fivefold ministry. It is proof of spiritual health. Now, biology teaches us that when a child grows and becomes a teenager, certain changes begin to happen in your body that proves that you are now transiting. Is that true? From childhood into adulthood. That is the same way spiritually. You see a gentleman 
who is looking very lean, looking almost as if he's, he's a skeleton walking. But that gentleman gets to teenage and all of a sudden he begins to be build and now he becomes a tall, dark, tall, tall, dark and handsome. <laughs> Are we together now? What changed? Growth. There are now manifestations. Ask a baby to lift this. Ask a baby to lift this. They may not be able to lift it. Ask a baby to lift even a bottle. But now you find people who lift crates. They lift all kinds of things and they just lift it as though they are lifting a piece of rag. That ability came with growth. Can I be honest with you? There are certain mountains that confronted you five years ago and you did not have the anointing to do anything about them. By now, you should even walk as though they don't exist because of the excellency of power that is at work in you. If yesterday's challenge still seemed to have dominion over you, something might be wrong. Are we blessed? The outworkings of the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, now unto him who is able to do. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that works where? In us. There is an ability of the Spirit that works in me. This is not just a Pentecostal talk. You have to believe this. As you are growing spiritually, a day comes, you look at your child, he returns with something, a result that you don't like. You know that you have grown spiritually. Son, come. You can lay your hands. And in the name of Jesus, I impart upon you that grace for wisdom. Go and excel. Maturity. You are in the marketplace. You are in a bus. And someone is just crying and saying, my life, how will these things continue? And you look at him and say, well, I'm a child of God. So what? He said, I'm about to show you the implication. Can you hold my hand and let me agree with you? We have just five minutes and the bus comes to a standstill. Father, let my life reveal the excellency of your power over this person's situation. And you drop from the bus. And after two years, you find someone looking for you and running and saying, I remember you. You held my hand and prayed a two-minute prayer and every closed door opened. I want to follow your God. There is something about the excellency of power. Listen to me. When it has to do with power, it is not for men of God. It is for believers. Jesus said in my name, they, not some, all that believe shall cast out devils. Have you registered your impact in the realm of the spirit through the outworking of power in your life? Can the demon say, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Joshua Selman, I know. Have you registered your name? Can I be honest with you? Most believers think and respectfully speaking, I admit that we men of God have made a mistake because we have given people an impression that if it does not come through us, they cannot access genuine power. No. We are here as an added advantage, but intrinsically, the basis of your confidence and your power in this kingdom is the reality of the, of the Holy Spirit living in you and the power that comes through your relationship with him. He says, be strong in the Lord. Everyone say, I'm strong in the Lord. Prophesy. Say, I am not weak. Look at me. Stretch your hands before me and declare. Say, these hands, you are anointed from today for signs, for wonders, for miracles. One more time. Stretch those hands. Say, in the name of Jesus, these hands produce results. In the name of Jesus, these are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. Turn it into prayer in one minute. I'm not ordinary. The divine life is at work in me. In the name of Jesus, the son of the living God, there is an implication to my spiritual growth. I may not be a man of God standing in the pulpit, but I'm the son of the living God. I declare.